Is this working? Yeah, oh, perfect. So uh, we're right on time, which is perfect. Thank you all so much for your presentations. I mean, there were some you know, differences, but a lot of similarities between them. Um, Maxine, your presentation, your lit review sort of reminded me of a quote uh, that I read or heard at a summit, actually, probably about eight years ago. It's Kane Race, and I'm going to just slay it. But the, the basic idea is, um, you know, if you read gay literature, um, you learn that all gay men want is to be loved. But if you read, you know, if you were to read the HIV prevention literature, you would learn that all gay men want to do is die. Right, so because of gay men putting themselves at risk, and so it, you know, like that quote, I think applies and might imply in some ways to sort of thinking about, you know, what do we actually know? What can we learn from literature about sexualized substance use? But what is it? What is the actual reality of it? Right, we can't really, you know, it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. But yeah, thank you. Um, so I think we'll just jump right into questions. Hey, thank you for your presentations and for your um, frontline work. The way that you meet people with compassion and nuance is, is really inspiring. Um, I was curious, and feel free to be very anecdotal, but how does uh, sex work and transactional sex show up in y'all's work? What was the last word you said? Oh, yeah. I'll, I can go. Um, so, uh, one very practical way in which um, our work has um, started kind of the, um, the journey of supporting people in the sex economy um, is through this really wonderful partnership that we're starting with The Corner, um, who um, has certainly been leading us in understanding kind of what our um, the issues that are voiced by um, people who are working in that economy are saying and what they are facing. And I, th and I think from as the perspective of a frontline worker, the importance of listening to that and hearing what those folks say and taking their lead in what needs to be done. I think there is a plethora of research that can say X, Y, and Z when it comes to substance use and the intersections that that finds within sex work, but really it doesn't mean jack shit if like the people who are a part of that uh, industry are saying something else. So I think the way in which my work at least is just simply um, trying to both not take up space but also provide support uh, by the means in which people are saying that they need it. Um, I can answer a bit on that. Uh, a lot of the people that are engaged in sex work that I work with, actually, it's kind of interesting. Even then, some who use crystal meth in their personal sex life would much rather stay sober um, while they're working. And that's something that they are normally really great at doing and uh, see as really problematic if they sort of like oh, this time I had a client and I was high, and that's really not one thing that I do. One thing that's kind of interesting is that these are the people who are sort of like officially sex workers, but then in the grand world of uh, PNP, so much of the sex is transactional uh, because they're the people who host the party or normally like provide the drugs, and then there are people who kind of like prize themselves but have a bit of guilt saying, um, I've never paid for my drug. I've, I know people who have used crystal met for 5, 10, 15 years who are like, I've never spent $1. Um, and sometimes I go somewhere to have sex just because this person is providing the drug and they don't consider themselves a uh, sex worker. So that, these are like kind of like very difficult conversation. It's very, um, yeah, transactional. Like I crashed somewhere because I kind of like just passed out in their place and the next morning they were there still. Uh, so is that sex work if you're crashing someone's house. Um, so there's a lot of nuances uh, in there, and I think it's important to talk about it and to destigmatize uh, transactional sexuality, because we all have it. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't answer your question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no? Okay, thank you everybody for your wonderful presentations. It was really great to hear those different perspectives. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm perhaps maybe assuming, but I hear a lot of discussion about the problematic substance use and the intervention when someone self-identified that it's a problem. 
And I'm wondering if anybody on the panel can theorize about earlier interventions that can be done, uh, ways that we can meet guys where they're at and, and reduce the harms in sex, uh, sexualized drug use or intervene to perhaps head off sexualized drug use, turning into problematic uh, drug use. Where are the opportunities there? Because I think that there might be some. So if anybody wants to theorize about that, feel free. Yeah, I'm like really excited about this question because I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I remember when we did uh, Hi, My Name is Tina, the website, and then when uh, the GMSH started talking about like uh, PNP My Way, like the first thing that I wanted to do, and it didn't happen for a myriad of reasons, but that when people arrive on the website, there would be like four categories and being like, I'm thinking about starting, I'm using right now, and that's fine. I think of quitting, and I'm supporting a loved one. Uh, who is using, and I wish there was those four categories, and there is very little work in any categories except the one that uh, I'm offering. Uh, one thing that I want, so I think the, the loved one workshop is sort of like one step into uh, answering that. So a lot of the people of my 17 participants were there uh, for people who have not started engaging in any care. So uh, that's kind of one step further preventive. Uh, we, were t we were talking about that at the airport yesterday, you and me. Uh, but like there is no preventive uh, campaign that is not fear-based. Uh, and like I feel like this is such a basic, simple thing that ASOs and services could put together. It's not complicated. We've created campaign. We've, like we're champions at creating campaign. Why is there not one? Uh, maybe there's one and then like someone in the room is like, uh, actually, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it. Please send it my way so I can copy it and paste it uh, in Ontario or in Toronto. Uh, one thing that I'm really excited that I want to do it, starting in the winter is um, engaging those sport leagues. I love the idea of in, engaging uh, drag queens, but I think sport leagues I don't know in your community, but in Toronto, there's such big leaders, dodgeball, volleyball, water polo, and like having those leaders start talking about the, and just connecting people to care, regardless where they're at. Um, that's really sort of like important talking about crystal meth, not just to people who are coming to reach me because they have a problematic, because they view their, their consumption problematic. So yes, we need to put some effort in helping those people because their sufferance is real. But I think the next step is very obviously to like go larger and start talking about other people and say like you're using right now, cool. Uh, and then how can we enhance your life? Because everybody, including people who don't use substance, cause can make their life better. Mm. I have a lot of to say about this. You guys can go. And <laughs> I think Jordan, just to reflect back, I think you raise um, like an important gap in the literature. Um, which should be explored. Like, we don't need another paper to tell us that guys who PMP are overrepresented by new HIV and STI infections, <laughs> right? And like, we've had conversations with guys who have used particularly crystal meth for a number of years and are able to um, maintain a sense of agency and control and not experience um, some of the harms that, that we've been hearing about today. And so it's like, if we could tap into like, like, what is it about those folks that they're able to maintain that sort of sweet spot, quote unquote, of their, um, their substance use? I think that would be worthwhile to explore. I think, okay, it works. <laughs> I think that we could start in, you know, in health services when people are going to see their doctor or seeing their nurse or somebody there at the clinic, even if they don't have any like problematic use of drugs, you can ask a question, you know, and have like a safe space to talk about it. And not, and when I'm saying that, I'm not saying that only for gay or LGBTQ plus people. I'm talking about the straight people too, because they have sex lives. Yeah, mm -hmm. they have sex. So, <laughs> and they use drugs too, and they, they use alcohol too. So just mm -hmm. talk about it to everybody and create that space that they allow them to, to talk mm -hmm. and express themselves. And I think it would be the first step for the prevention that we, we can do. Of course, we can do campaigns and everything, but this is cheaper. <laughs> yeah. No, I would um, agree, like, as a point of sort of early intervention, like, for sure, assessments. We know guys who PMP are presenting to sexual health clinics, um, and we're doing a really poor job of um, identifying them and, you know, encouraging reflection or linking them to relevant supports. I mean, we're missing data on 
a significant amount of testing data in the province for you know folks because the nurses aren't even asking around sexual identity and sexual practices. Um, so there is a lot of work to do with our public health colleagues. Yeah, it's like we need to like kick stigma in the butt and like move it. Like I'm, I should not hear, and I do hear people who work in our field saying like, oh no, I, I don't work with Crystal, I don't, and I'm like, well then don't do this work. Like go, go work somewhere else. Uh, if you don't, if you don't want to touch it, like there's this big stigma. I've heard guys saying like, "Oh yes, I see it. this therapist on this side. I've seen her for five years, but she doesn't know I use crystal meth." And I'm like, "How is it that in five years your therapist doesn't know? Uh, and what are you talking about?" Uh, but there's like such stigma in uh, around it. And if people would be willing to ask, they're so simple assessment tools. Um, that we can give and like yeah nurses should be like oh yeah do you like what's happening and then people would feel more comfortable to talk about it and then realize that yeah it's not the dangerous scary person that we see on the posters of yeah. the face that represent yeah. anyway I'm tired of I this mean, image I just think on like the most fundamental level particularly for folks doing frontline service delivery like I think, and I welcome any sort of challenge on this, but our role is to help gay men make choices. They're going to be faced with choices around the sex they want, the sex they're having, substance use is in our community, um, and so if we can ask the right questions and support guys to um, navigate these complexities and make choices that they can feel good about, um, I think that would go a long way, and I don't think it's that hard to do. Okay, well we've, we've, I see we have two questions, so maybe we'll, we'll go. Um, okay, um, I have two brief questions, uh, hopefully. Um, the first one is uh, for uh, Vincent. Um, you were talking about some evaluations that you made um, for the groups, uh, so I was just curious about what, uh, did, what did those evaluations include it? Um, and my second question uh, is for Max uh, from VAMP. Um, I was just um, I was just curious to know how we could uh, work together. Uh, I work at him <laughs> Health Initiative for Men, and um, yeah, I'm curious of your thoughts on maybe working together to address uh, yeah sexualized uh, uh, meth use um, as we as a community organization mm -hmm. and you as um, a health a health authority. So uh, yeah, those are my two questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. All I'll say is let's just do it. <laughs> let's work together. <laughs> Find me after. <laughs> uh, our relation, I was trying to make the evaluation fairly short so that um, people could do it. Uh, so we asked like how many times they came and when they graduated and it was sort of like their overall satisfaction uh, if they had access to uh, other care. Um, what this resource was provided that uh, they could not see and find anywhere else. Um, and if there's some other things that they would like to see the program evolving uh, towards. Uh, if you're interested, you have my email address. I can send you uh, the link uh, of it. it. It was a bit, yeah, it was simple, but. Great, thanks, and I think we'll, we'll take one, one more question and have maybe have just keep it as quick questions. as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have five questions? No, I have one. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, and you've already touched on it a bit. So I'm coming at this from a policy analyst perspective, and obviously I'm not a member of the uh, gay or bi men's community, so a lot of what I know is just from the literature. And according to the literature, the biggest gap for um, homoanic substance use for men who party and play or men who do chem sex is this gap in service with um, dealing with the substance use and the sexualized drug use, which some of you guys touched on, so it was great to hear that there are interventions that exist. My question is, what do you in an ideal world see as the kinds of interventions that we should be doing or funding that can help this? So is it more like options earlier on? Is it more stuff like you're doing, Vincent, with your program? Or what do you guys think, basically? I mean, just a few things quickly. I think they should be integrated, interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. tailored, mm -hmm. um, and available in ways that are convenient and appealing to gay men. 
some new ways of service delivery should be explored, I think, around this particular topic. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing lots of shake, nodding heads, so um, I think that we're, we're going to be able maybe assume <laughs> that everyone agrees. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your work with us. I think that, like, you know, our, in the sector, we're very good at talking about sexual health. Like, we, we know how to talk about sex in, in lots of different ways. And one thing to maybe consider as a goal is to be as good at talking about substance use yes. and working around substance use as we are about talking about sexual health and addressing it in our communities. Um, so thanks very much to the panelists and to the community. <laughs>